Father, we thank you for your goodness, mercy, grace, and compassion. And above all, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his precious blood, for your holy written word, and for the mighty Holy Spirit. It is with great joy, unspeakable, and full of glory that we deposit this service into your charge for safekeeping, thanking you in advance for anointing every ear, mind, heart, and soul to receive the engrafted word that is able to save, rescue, and preserve our very souls. For all that shall be said, wrought, revealed, and manifested, we covenant to give you and you alone all the praise, the honor, and the glory. I thank you for anointing this vessel of clay to minister life to your people, boldly without fear, favor, or respect of persons, declaring the unsearchable riches of Christ, that your word may proceed as it does from your own mouth. It will not return to you void, but it will accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereunto it is sent. We believe that we receive these petitions which we have desired of you, for we ask them in that mighty, matchless, and majestic name that is above every name, the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Praise the Lord. Hey, little hand clap for the uh, music, worship, and arts department, so faithfully ushering us in to the presence of God and preparing our hearts for the spoken word. I'd like you to open your Bibles now to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29. I want to talk to you about, amen, understanding the times. Understanding the times. Uh, we've spoken about this before, but I believe that there is an acute awareness, perhaps as never before, that things are different. You know, if you were to take pause and just think backwards for a minute, 10 years, 15 years, you may not even have to go that far. You may think back five years or 25 years and consider the way things were and now the way things are. Because according to the scripture, we will have to consider things that are yet to come. So it's important for us to understand the times. Certainly when Jesus was conducting his earthly ministry here, Yes, as the scripture says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Now, I want you to understand that we are part of the body of Christ. And as God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, hey, we're anointed with the Holy Ghost and with power in Jesus' mighty name. Now, certainly we ourselves as individuals are not Jesus himself, but we are a part of him. And he is absolutely a part of us. For our lives are hidden in God with Christ. We need to understand that. Again, when we speak about this type of a topic, understanding the times and the seasons and the end time events and so forth, and as you've heard me say on many occasions, I have explain to you that there is definitely a prophetic timeline. That is P-R-O-P-H-E-T-I-C, prophetic timeline. In other words, the Bible reveals events that will be shortly coming to pass. Now, shortly is a relative term. It's an adverb, okay? Shortly, I mean, shortly could be 10 minutes. <laughs> In God's economy, shortly could be 10 years, okay? 10 decades. So, shortly and soon, you will see many of these words used in scripture. And particularly when you are looking at the prophetic books, you look at the book of Daniel, you read the prophets, and certainly in the book of the Revelation, you, you will see words like then, and then soon, and shortly coming to pass. Again, these are relative terms. We don't exactly know uh, by the hour and the minute or the date when any of these major events that are revealed in the scripture will occur. But Jesus did assure us that we would be able to recognize the signs of the times. In other words, there's conditions. I mean, think about it. Every year, now here in Georgia, we get to enjoy all four seasons. Now, there's some places on this earth that the only season seems to be summer and the only season seems to be winter. Uh, certainly at the poles, the North Pole, South Pole, it's cold all the time, right? And on the equator of the earth that goes completely around the circumference of the earth, that, that area on the planet tends to be very tropical and very hot. Uh, amen. 
And, uh, but nevertheless, we get all four seasons. So here's my point, you know, winter, spring, summer, and fall. Well, that said, we know, we, we have a sense of when it's coming. Now, we can look on our calendar here in Georgia, but that's not always the guarantee. You know, we think, well, you know, spring begins in uh, uh, April and uh, whatever, and then winter starts in December and the fall starts in September and so forth. And, you know, you can go by your, your calendar a little bit, but sometimes the weather may be warmer or cooler due to different natural circumstances. But that said, when we know, a season is coming, and we can see the signs of it. Now, right now, it's the fall of the year here uh, where we are in Georgia, and so the leaves are definitely falling. That's why they call it fall. Uh, they're falling all over the place. There's millions and millions of them. And so we say, oh, it's fall. It's going to start turning cooler from the hot summer months. So what do we do? We prepare. We do different things because we recognize the change in the seasons. Well, we need to recognize the spiritual change of seasons as well. You know, five years ago, 10, 20 years ago, and probably if you speak to some of the elders, they'll tell you 50, 60, 70 years ago how things were, you know, in terms of our culture, our society, relationships between people, uh, the way we greeted one another, the way we treated one another, uh, many, many aspects and now, in this present time, it seems like the entire social structure and the culture is moving away from what we call familiar or remember in our respective times. Now, the, the common phrase when we start reflecting is back in the day. I've heard that said by people from... <laughs> Every ethnic group <clears throat> from every generation, I, I imagine it's just a catchphrase, sort of like, you know, at the end of the day. <laughs> Everybody's saying that now, at the end of the day. Just like everybody in the business world or the marketplace in exchange with uh, clients and patients and customers say, well, it's my pleasure, all right? So we, we've adopted and we've grasped onto some phrases here. And, and like I said, when we're reflecting, Everybody, I don't care, listen, no matter what ethnic group, black, white, red, yellow, brown, young, old, in between, in the middle, everywhere, people say, well, you know, back in the day, because it's relative to what they're about to say to you. What is back in the day? Well, they're really saying back in their day or back to a certain time of remembrance, and they, you know, there are certain markers back there, certain events that people mark in time. They say, well, I remember when. That's another popular phrase. Uh, again, when is a relative term. Back in the day is a relative term in terms of its phraseology. And of course, Jesus will say soon or shortly or quickly. These are relative terms. Now, the scripture says that a day is as a, or a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is as a day. So, if God says shortly, <laughs> what does that mean? Uh, how many days, how many years, if a day is as a thousand years to God? Well, shortly could be several millennia, you know, so many thousands of years or so many centuries. Nobody exactly knows, but I know one thing, we can certainly tell the signs of the times, and Jesus certainly addressed it. Now, what I want to do basically is to remind you that even in the discussion of this topic and understanding the times and the seasons, because I believe my assignment from God is to help God's people understand what these things that are revealed in the scripture, prophetically uh, coming up, what's going on right now, to help God's people recognize and understand what does that look like? What does that look like in real time? And more specifically, what does that look like in, in the time in which we're living? Right now, this particular season, what does it look like? How, how can you tell? Um, a lot of people say, well, you know, didn't God destroy the earth with a flood one time? Yeah, he did that. Um, back in Noah's day, the account of it is back there in Genesis, the sixth chapter and so forth. And, and, and you know, it's amazing, uh, but it, it also it reveals so much that flood, that entire episode reveals so much. It reveals so much about the conditions of the world. It revealed much about God and where he is. It revealed a lot about Noah and his family being that Noah 
and his three sons, Noah, his wife, and his three sons and three daughters-in-law were the only souls saved. They're the only survivors from that incredible deluge that lasted 40 days, 40 nights, and the water stayed on the face of the earth for months before it began to go away. Uh, but nevertheless, I, I see a lot in that particular picture. Now, God put a rainbow in the sky, indicating that he would never again destroy the world with a flood. Listen to the promise. He put the rainbow in the sky to indicate or signify his promise that he would never again destroy the earth with a flood. Now, what God did not promise was that there would be no more flooding. We have just in recent times and seasons seen incredible scenes of flooding, a lot of destruction and so forth. And I mean, it's very localized. It's, it's a far cry from the whole world being submerged underwater. Can you, can you imagine that? Many of you have taken airplane trips to go here and there, even go out in the country, thousands of miles flying for hours and hours. And, and you look out the airplane window and you say, oh my goodness, does the ocean ever end? If you've been on a cruise and they get out there, they, you know, the ship's out in the water, and everywhere you look, northward, southward, eastward, and westward, nothing but water. You say, my goodness, where's the land? It's, it's only when sometimes when you do those kinds of things that you really yourself can see in real time the vastness of this place we call planet Earth. It's an amazing thing, and the Lord is the creator of it. He's the creator of the heavens and the earth and all that in them is it's remarkable. It's, you know, even when I just stop to say that and think about it a minute, it puts me in a state of awe. And this is the reason why we purpose to inform you and not to put you in fear. First of all, you don't have to fear anything. You don't have to be afraid. When God gets on the scene or sends an angel and you have an encounter, one of the first things you see here, fear not. Jesus said it, the prophets said it, that were assigned by God. God Almighty has revealed himself and said, fear not. He spoke to Abraham, his friend. God spoke to the prophets. Listen, he would always say, fear not. There's no need to be afraid. Even in the face of insurmountable odds, when God's people were facing armies of enemies and nations that rose up against the people of God, and the Lord would send a man of God in there, send a prophet, and say, fear not, don't, don't be dismayed by this great multitude that you see. And the Lord, of course, would bring great deliverance. He would bring great deliverance, great provision, great protection. And certainly through his servants, the prophets, God would bring great proclamation. God would proclaim things. He would absolutely decree and declare things and would do it through the mouths of his servants, the prophets. And of course, now we're in New Testament times. We're operating with the fivefold ministry gifts of the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. God is still speaking to his people to this very day. He hasn't gone mute. He hasn't gone silent. He's still speaking. Every time you turn on this program, God's speaking. He's bringing a word, bringing a message. He's speaking to you to edify you, to build you up and charge you up, to exhort you, to, shall I say, share cautions, to warn us, to admonish us. And he also speaks to us to comfort us, to encourage us, to inspire us. When you have that perspective uh, prior to listening to the word of God, it creates a different level of expectation on the inside of you. When you're hearing something that's going to be speaking to you under edification, exhortation, and comfort, which is the absolute definition of prophecy, that is what it means to prophesy, to speak unto men, and again, generically speaking, men and women, to speak unto men under edification, exhortation, and comfort. Those three components are going to be involved in the simple manifestation or gift of prophecy. Amen. So, God wants to encourage our hearts. Okay, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. So much for my introduction, right? All right, so verse 11 says this. And here's the point I want to make to you. And this is, people have heard me say this so many times. I want to show you where I get it from. First of all, 
as a citizen of God's kingdom, as a believer, a follower of Jesus Christ, as a Christian, you always have something to look forward to. Look at Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace, got that? And not of evil, to give you an expected end or a good outcome, a place of hope. God says, I know the thoughts that I think toward you. That's what he said. Uh, thoughts of peace, he said, and not of evil. Now listen, God is not thinking evil thoughts about you. God is thinking good, peaceful thoughts toward you. After all, it was this same God who inspired the Apostle Paul, who wrote down something that's so powerful. And I tell you what, I really want to encourage you to meditate on this passage of Scripture as often as you possibly can. I'm going to skip us to Philippians chapter 4. Now, the first statement I made was you always have something to look forward to. And the basis of that is Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11, according to what God said to the prophet there. He said, look, I've got these thoughts of peace for you and not of evil to give you hope and an expected outcome. So that's good news. All right, Philippians chapter 4, because what, what kind of thoughts does God think toward? Well, look at this, Philippians 4, verse 8. This is inspir inspiration from the Holy Spirit to the Apostle Paul. In the 8th verse, he said, Now finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. This is a clear look at the pattern of the way God thinks. This is the way he thinks toward us. This is, it's just summed up back in Jeremiah as, I have these thoughts of peace toward you and not of evil. Now, not only that, I want you to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I beg your pardon, chapter 2, excuse me. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Getting a little bit ahead of myself there. All right. After I tell people that you always have something to look forward to, and I'm speaking to the people of God, I'm speaking to the believers, the followers of Jesus. I'm speaking to the citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Now, you say, well, why do you only speak to them? Well, listen, good news. The good news is to all people. It, it really is. But, you know, in the letters, the epistles in the Bible, the apostle Paul or James or Peter would be speaking to a certain segment of individuals, of people. Paul wrote all these letters to the church, which is made up of people. Amen. He gave them words of edification, exhortation, and comfort. Literally, the Holy Spirit was using these writers of the New Testament to speak to the people, to edify them, to exhort them, and to comfort them. And you'll find every one of those components involved in these writings, in these epistles, whether they were by James, John, Paul, or Peter. All those components are in every one of their writings, all right? So, the best is yet to come. You always have something to look forward to, and the best is yet to come. Second Corinthians chapter 2. Notice uh, it says here in verse 14. Now thanks be unto God, which, what? Always. Whoa. Who can guarantee always? God. Thanks be unto God. Paul is giving thanks where the thanks is due. He's giving it to God. And why is he giving God such thanks? Thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. I love this specificity. He, God always causes us to triumph in Christ. That's a powerful phrase throughout the New Testament as well, where you see the, the uh, phrase in him, in whom, in Christ, in God. That in, that's a preposition. That's the grammatical function of the word in. Tiny little word, two letters, I-N. But it's a preposition indicating position. And what is the position? That we are always caused to triumph in Christ. God causes us always to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. So that's where the phrase, you always have something to look forward to, and the best is yet to come. 
those two verses, Jeremiah 29, 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, are the foundation for that phrase. Now, God revealed it to me. I've been saying it to our congregation. I say it to many, many people that I get to meet uh, in various uh, places that I'm privileged to go uh, to, because God will speak to me and say, I want you to encourage them. So tell them this. Amen. So I thank God for that. Now, understand something. <clears throat> and I want us to go to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 2. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 2. Now, I'm talking about understanding the times. And Jesus definitely told us that we could serve. Well, he challenged some religious folks while he was here on earth. He said, you know, you guys look to the horizon and you see the sky lowering and red and whatnot. And you say, man, there's a storm a brewing. And then he says, uh, you look to the other side and you say, man, it's going to be clear weather ahead. And so Jesus said, how is it that you can tell the signs of the sky, but you can't tell the signs of the times? Now, there are definitely signs in manifestation. I'm talking about right now in real time in our present day. Signs that Jesus described in great detail. Signs that are also described in great detail further on by the Apostle Paul. Uh, I'm going to go over those things with you. But first of all, 1 Samuel chapter 2. And I want us to look at uh, verse number 30. And what does it say here? <clears throat> Wherefore, the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed that your house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, be it far from me, for them that honor me, I will honor. And they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. And that's God basically declaring the way relationships between people and himself function. God doesn't want people to be dishonorable. The Bible says that God is not willing, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, God is not willing that any should perish, or that is to say to be cut off from the life of God. But God is willing that all should come to repentance. But see, that's, that's a personal and individual decision that people must make for themselves. God isn't forcing people into the kingdom. God is not holding people hostage. God, listen, if you be willing and obedient, Isaiah said, you will eat the good of the land. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. This is how we access the kingdom. This is how we come into the kingdom of heaven. This is how we come into the family of God. Scripture says that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved, regenerated, be born again. Remember what Jesus told Nicodemus? Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. If there's anything you must be, you must be born again. To do what? To see the kingdom, to enter the kingdom. In other words, and this is what I tell people because folks find this shocking. I imagine when a clergyman as myself says to them, well, you know, God doesn't send people to hell. People send themselves. Uh, and frankly, the choice between heaven and hell is yours, but it is based on patterns and principles. Now, you have to understand, Jesus said, man, listen, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That is exactly how everything and everyone works. You say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. A lot of people don't even know the Lord is their Savior. That's true. But that doesn't change the fact that when Jesus said that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Look, the scriptures are God-breathed. The, these scriptures are, as the Spirit of God has moved on men and inspired them to write down these various sayings and all this account that God has given us in what we call the canon of scripture. Uh, and it is exactly that way. The Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. <clears throat> now, I don't care what anybody thinks about that. I don't care what opinion people bring up about it. 
Oh, there's a lot of opinionation in the world going on right now. That doesn't change God, and it doesn't change the truth either. Listen, you've heard me say this. If a hundred million people say something stupid, it's still stupid. Just because a hundred million people say so doesn't make it smart, especially if it's stupid. You not say, well, stupid compared to what? Compared to the Word of God. Because we live, as Jesus said, according to every word that comes out of the mouth of God. So God says there's a way that seems right to a man. In other words, we look at things and we say, well, that's okay. We're doing it. They're doing it. Everybody's doing it. I'm going to do it. And if the Bible says specifically you should not do that, if the Bible gives a warning and an admonition that you should not be engaged in that type of activity, if the Bible warns you about thinking or meditating upon the wrong thing and you think you can just negate that by carrying on and doing what's right as you see in your own eyes, that's not going to change. The Bible says just because men do not believe does not make the word of God of none effect. Now, listen, we're living in seasons and times right now where we're... We're seeing people, leaders, all kinds of folks doing uh, stupid things. They're saying crazy things. They're saying things and attempting to redefine institutions of God's own making. They're trying to redefine the word of God. They're trying to redefine the truth. They say, well, wait a minute. God's got his truth. I want my truth. And this has been the Achilles heel in humanity since the fall in the Garden of Eden. Everybody wants their truth, but who wants the truth of God? The Bible said men would do things that are right in their own eyes. That was the case in Noah's day. <laughs> they were going after everything and everyone except God. I tell you what, Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah and as it was in the days of Lot, and as it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, you're going to find the same conditions prevailing in the time and the season in which the, the Son of Man, that is Jesus, the Savior, is, is going to be coming back. Now, we're seeing these signs. Now, understand, when he said as it was in the, uh, the days of Noah and Lot, of course, you know, Lot was in Sodom and Gomorrah, and fire and brimstone fell out of heaven and wiped out the whole cities. And, look. It's not, the, remember, now God promised he's not going to destroy the earth again with a flood. He's not going to cover the whole earth, the whole planet earth with a flood with water. Okay, and everybody's under it, drown it. Listen, no, no. Understand the conditions when Jesus said as it was in the days, and he was very specific about what was going on in those days. He said, you know what? They were eating, and they were drinking, and they were marrying, and they were giving in marriage. He said that they were planting, you know, like gardens, and, the, and, and they were building. It, look around. Look around. People are doing all of that, all right? Amen. People are eating. People are drinking. People are marrying. People are giving in marriage. People are planting, and people are building. So the, the business as usual of humanity and mankind is going on right now as it was before the flood, as it was before fire and brimstone fell out of heaven onto the cities of the plain called Sodom and Gomorrah. In other words, folks were doing what they were doing. But now on closer examination, and, and I want to encourage you to go back and study those chapters that uh, talk about Noah's Ark and the day and the climate and uh, the environment, and when I say the environment, I'm not just talking about atmospheric environment. I'm talking about the social construct. I'm talking about the culture of the times. Get your good Bible and encyclopedia because there's a lot of information that, that's available out of those times. And, and what happened, what those people were like. They had come to a place where they, they, they came to the tipping point, my brothers and sisters, okay? And consequently, the flood, consequently, the fire and the brimstone and so forth. And there were other tipping points. We had the tipping point with Pharaoh in Egypt, who held hostage and captive as slaves, God's chosen people, Israel. And God sent a messenger to Pharaoh. He, you know, I love God. He comes diplomatically. He says, Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go. 
Moses went in there. He didn't make a big beef. He didn't throw his weight around. He just said, hey, thus saith the Lord God, Pharaoh, I'm his messenger. I've come. I have a message for you. Let my people go. Pharaoh said, I'm not letting these people go. I don't know your God. I don't know you. Forget it. I'm not letting these folks go. All right. So he just said in the face of God, I'm not going to do what God says. You know, God appealed to Pharaoh. God showed signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. Signs and wonders that, frankly, he nor his magicians could duplicate. They could not duplicate. Forget about movies, you see. They could not duplicate those things. Look, those magicians of Pharaoh threw down their rods after Moses put his down. Remember, he threw the shepherd's rod down. It became a serpent. And then the magicians threw their rods down, and they became serpents. This is recorded biblical history. So it happened just as the Bible said that it did. However, only one rod was picked up out of three. The other two were swallowed up by the one that Moses put down. That had, I, you know what, I wish I could do a little time travel and just be a fly on the wall and take a look at that whole scenario. I'd like to see the looks on the face. I'd like to see Pharaoh turn pale as a ghost, you know. <laughs> hey, what happened? What just happened here? But, you know, God used diplomatic approaches to Pharaoh. He demonstrated his own, God demonstrated his capacity, his ability. And, and to be honest with you, in the, scheme, in the scheme of the entire word of God, the demonstrations that God gave Pharaoh, and there were 10 of them, would, would, would be just a thumbnail worth of whatever God's capable of doing. He, he was sending, really, God's, it was deliberate. God basically mocked and showed to Pharaoh and the Egyptians that everything that they were worshiping, because the Egyptians were a polytheistic society, they believed in many gods. There was a God, a statue. That's, they made, made their gods. Come on, somebody. They made their gods out of stone and marble and whatnot. And they put the heads on them that uh, resemble creatures of the earth. Nobody, are you listening to me? And God came along and basically mocked every one of them to show Pharaoh and the Egyptians, none of them is a God. None of them has the power like I do. None of them can come and make a demand of a sitting head of state and, and, and boldly demonstrate that he can overcome them. And that's exactly what God did. And see, Pharaoh himself was considered a God. They had to watch out because, see, even in today's times, <laughs> yes, my brothers and sisters, there are people out there in the world that think themselves to be a God. They might be a sitting head of state. They might be in some more subordinate position. Maybe they're not a sitting head of state, but they're sitting somewhere with the attitude and the arrogance that they have all power, that they can do anything they want to do, any way they want to do it. And God is like by the wayside. He, he has nothing to say about it. There's nothing he can do about it. And on, on. that, listen, those kinds of attitudes are absolutely prevailing in our times, and they are absolutely a sign of the times and the seasons in which we're living. You're seeing haughtiness, pride, and arrogance as it has never been seen in human existence. There are, listen, there is an unprecedented degree of pride and arrogance and evil and wickedness that probably would make the people in Noah's day blush. Even the Sodomites blush. You say, that couldn't be so. I mean, look how God judged those places. Now, hey, the final judgment hasn't hit yet, okay? So we can't imagine what that would look like. The primary message is this, my brothers and sisters. Never allow the world to entice you into accepting its standards of success. See, we're living in a time now where they call good evil and in which they call evil good. I'm going to say this principle once more to you because if you want a principle to live by moving forward, here's one for you. Never allow the world to entice you into accepting its standards of success. You want to know what real success is? It's defined in Joshua 1 and 8. 
and the literal Hebrew is translated there, it, when you obey God, when you do the word of God and observe to do according to all that's written therein, then will you make your way prosperous and you will enjoy good success. Really, the phrase means you will deal wisely in the affairs of life. How does that come about? It comes about when you don't allow the world to entice you into accepting its standards of success. Number two, never seek the world's approval. <laughs> That's a tough one. Never seek the world's approval. Now, everyone wants to do well in life. Everyone wants to be respected. Everyone wants to be liked. Everyone wants to be accepted and so forth. But listen, never seek the world's approval. If, listen, if it's a diff, it, listen, if it's a choice between God's approval and the world's approval, there you go. If it's a choice between God's approval and the world's approval, you want to go with God's approval, not the world's approval. God's approval will always, always overbear or overcome the world's approval, God's approval. You want to do that which is right in the sight of God. Now, I know today's times, we, the political arena, the marketplace, it's, I see what Jesus was saying as it was in those days. You know why those judgments came? Because there was wickedness, there was evil, there was corruption everywhere, up one side and down the other, just permeating the fabric of society, permeating the culture. People were doing unmentionable and unspeakable things. Now, simply because we don't see it all the time in front of our own eyes doesn't mean people are not doing unspeakable and unmentionable things now. And you know what? Yeah, it's getting mentioned. It's getting spoken about. I mean, it's in the, it's in the everyday report of what's going on in the world around us. Every day, it's in all of our publications. It, is cre it has, isn't creeping. It has crept in to our institutions, the institution of education, the institution of the marketplace or business, the institution of family. All of this stuff is creeping in to our social construct and within our cultural bounds. And this is going on in nations around the world. We can easily become tunnel vision because we're here in the United States of America, or maybe you're in whatever country you're receiving this uh, stream from. Maybe you're in the African continent. Maybe you're over in the Asian continent receiving this. Maybe you're in South America watching this. Perhaps you're in Europe. And, and you know what? I'm not there, but I can assure you, if I were to ask you, do you see the same things going on where you are? Of course you do. Of course you do. When Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, man, listen, Jesus wasn't talking about the neighborhood down the street. He wasn't talking about the small town an hour's drive from where you are. Jesus was dealing with the world. Jesus was dealing with the nations. This is what God does. He, there's a time coming. In fact, I'll be honest with you, we're in the time. He's, he's already dealing with nations. Many people can't see it. I do see it by the very grace of God, not because my eyes are sharper, and it's not these with which I can see these things. It's my spiritual eyes. It's the, my spiritual understanding. It is what God reveals to me by his spirit to help me clearly understand and discern the signs of the time and what's going on. There are, listen, lawlessness. Is it out there? Sexual aversion. Is it out there? Corruption. Is it out there? Uh, I mean, debauchery. It, is it out there? Yes, it's out there. It's, it's everywhere. It, it's, it's difficult not to see it. And, and yet, as I said earlier on in the message, we're living in a season in which men are calling good evil and calling evil good. It, there are people that cheer folks on on the basis of how wicked, how evil, how uh, de depraved they can demonstrate themselves. Are you listening to me? And the people that want to do good are scoffed at, mocked, uh, derided, and put down. And you see, you have to understand, in, in society today, we, we have many people on both sides of that equation. And it's very conflicting. This, the divisiveness that's out there, most of us think, well, it's a political divisiveness. It's a marketplace divisiveness. It's, a, it's a, a, an ethnic 
divisiveness. No, no, no. It's a spiritual divisiveness. Let me tell you something. When you come down to the combatants on planet Earth, <laughs> there's only two. <laughs> there's God and the devil. That's it. And I'm not putting them on par because the devil comes nowhere near close to God Almighty. But this is what's going on in the world. This is how Jesus could speak with such accuracy, such effectiveness, and such authority to tell people as it was in those days, it's going to be the same way when I come back. That's right. Men's hearts failing them for fear, looking forward to the things that are going to be coming upon the face of the earth. Men's hearts failing them for fear. And when it says men's hearts failing them for fear, that's not exclusive to heart attacks or cardiac events or things like that. No, no, no. That's, that's also a revelation of minds being blown. I think they call it mental illness. And there's more talk of mental illness today than there was five years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago. No, I'm not saying there wasn't mental illness back then. But a lot of people didn't really talk about it. You know, if it cropped up, you know, it was a scandal and a stigma and people hid uh, folks that, they, you know, were not, we said the elevator didn't go all the way to the top. Okay? And so now it has almost become an institution in and of itself. Most folks never thought that the pandemic could bring about such a yield of collateral damage as it did. Youngsters messed up in their minds, socially deprived. The enemy will attack any human weakness. Were you lonely? Were you frustrated? Were you depressed? Did you feel the walls closing in on you? Did you feel helpless, hopeless? The enemy would rush in to fill that void, and it isn't anything good. And the outworking of that is still going on. Yes, there are still people that are dealing with what we call long-haul COVID uh, sickness and after effects and things of that nature. But listen, there are people that the virus itself may not have done much of anything to them physically, but mentally, uh, are you, emotionally, there's incredible damage that's out there. And the enemy is going everywhere he can to exploit these weaknesses and magnify them. And listen, suggest to people to do things they otherwise would never give thought to. What you see going on and what you hear every now and then in the news, and don't tell me you don't watch the news. I'm, listen, the Bible says let all things be done in moderation. Don't make a diet of it. Don't binge on it. It's, it's enough for you to know kind of what's going on. But most important, you need to really be tuned into the All Things Are Possible network. You need to be in a position to hear from the Holy Spirit because no one knows what's going on out here as he does. And he does. Praise God. So it's very important. Now, time will not allow me uh, to go into the minutiae of the word on that. But listen, stay tuned to the next segment because... I want to get in here and show you that everything that Jesus said would be happening in these times in which we're living. I'm going to point it out to you specifically. There's specific things, things that you can recognize. We're going to help you understand how to recognize them, how to identify them. But most importantly, what do you do when you recognize these things? What do you do when you're in the same space as some of the things that are being said, some of the things that are being done? How do you, as a citizen of the kingdom of God, respond to such things? What is the mandate from God that we should do when we behold these things coming upon the face of the earth and in the season in which we're living? We need to understand and know those things because I want to tell you, God absolutely has a plan. And the biggest clue is Jesus himself. Because when Jesus came here in his time, in his earthly ministry. And as I opened up with this passage of scripture from Acts, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. Listen, what is that scripture saying? People were oppressed of the devil during the time that Jesus was here. 
We can see from biblical history, folks were oppressed with the devil. When it says that the thoughts of men's hearts was evil continually. Remember, you know, the devil made his, uh, I say, his first earthly appearance from what I'm, from, from based on scripture, there in the Garden of Eden, meddling with Adam and Eve. Now, there's another story to that, but I don't have time to get into that right now. But we do see a clear appearance of Satan on the earth since the Garden of Eden. And he has been peddling his influence throughout the generations through to this day. We're going to gain a broader understanding of these things. And as I said to you, uh, the combatants is God Almighty, truth, right, honesty, integrity, Satan, the devil, that old serpent, Beelzebub, the father of lies, a murderer and a thief. These are the combatants. And you've got to understand that every time you see the nonsense that's going on in the world, it is, it's a collision course between good and evil, right and wrong, faithful and, and uh, uh, insolent and, and undependable and all this. That's what you have going on out here. There is a battle for the truth a battle for the truth. Amen. That's what's going on. And we'll pick this up as we continue to talk about understanding the times. Praise God. Well, whoever you are, wherever you are, I'm so glad you've tuned in. You know, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, this is the perfect time to get to know him. Yes, are these things going to come to pass that Jesus spoke of? Absolutely. He's not a man that he should lie, neither is he the son of man that he should repent. If he said it, He'll do it. And if he spoke it, he will make it good. It will come to pass, even as he has said. So I want to encourage you right now to pray this prayer, to receive Christ into your life and to become a part of God's family and a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. So bow your head right now with me and follow me in this simple prayer and say, Dear God, in heaven, I come to you realizing that in my life I have sinned and come short of your glory. I repent of all of my sin. And I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, who died on the cross and shed his blood to save me from all of my sin is the Lord of my life. And I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead, that I might be justified, just as if I had never sinned. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and live in me now. I believe that I receive eternal life through Jesus Christ, my Lord and my Savior, that I am now made a new creation in Christ Jesus, born again of the Spirit of God, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, praise the Lord. If you prayed that prayer with us, congratulations. We welcome you into the family of God. Further, you're officially a citizen of the kingdom of heaven with all the rights, promises, privileges, practices, principles thereunto. You even have a constitution. It's called the Holy Bible, the word of the living God.